Thanks for staying with us. Now, um, Tuesday night left every one of us speechless. In fact, up until this day, a lot of us are speechless um, because we didn't we didn't see um, we didn't see all the things that eventually happened. We didn't see it coming. I mean, with all the everything that's gone wrong in this, especially in Lagos State, we didn't we did not see it coming. And um, for us, it was important that today's show we focus on the aftermath of the protest. We also see. Um, we also see why the protest even took place in the first place. Let's not lose track of that because a lot of people have taken over. I mean, there are allegations of people being hijacking the protest, but when you also look at the things, you would know that, yes, there has been some form of hijack and all of that. But we thought to bring someone, you know, that has been through and, I mean, has legitimate reasons to be on the street to protest the end to SARS. And um, her name is Obianuju. She is a political science uh, scientist and a social justice campaigner. I'll bring her shortly, but before I bring her, please let us hear what you have to say. Um, to join the conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Wayshow Africa One with the hashtag Wayshow, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. Puti, in one minute before I bring in Obianuju, do you think that with the current state of things, we all have lost track of why we even went on the street to protest in the first place. Um, I think that, yes, yeah, so, well, so I wouldn't say lost track. I think at some point we tried to do too much too soon. Um, I remember at some point, you know, now the days have blended into days. I don't even know which day it was. Um, there was a video that I saw of a lady who was saying, look, this movement was about NSARS. Let's not get distracted. We started to see... Um, different factions talking about different things, different reforms, LGBTQ, there was all sorts of things. So it seemed like the message was getting muddled up and we were losing the essence, which was NSARS. And the NSARS message was so powerful that it was an organic movement. Let's remember that this thing started a simple clarion call and more people just kept coming out, more stories kept coming out. The list of victims kept growing. So it was a very, very powerful movement. But somewhere, um, we tried to do too much too soon. We tried to take on too much. It just all got muddled up, uh, really and truly. Because let's not forget, the NSARS movement itself is valid. It is a strong narrative, and we must not lose it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Bian Luju, um, thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. I know that a lot has been going on. You know, it took a, a lot for you to come on air to talk to us. Can you please just, you know, share your story briefly? Because I remember you sending us pictures of your brother. You know, share your story briefly with us. You know, what happened and, you know, why you decided to also join the protest? Um, my joining the protest was for two reasons. One, the personal fact that my brother was a victim of SARS brutality. And then secondly, because I'm a firm believer in justice and accountability, I believe that people should be held accountable for whatever they do. 2012, November 29th was the day my brother left the house and that was the last time we saw him. Okay, we saw him on the 30th, but he was already on, um, arrested by the police. We saw him at the police station. On the 29th, he left for a child dedication. It was at that dedication that all the boys that were there were arrested. And we got a call later in the night and we were told that they were arrested and taken to the Ajali police station in Anambra State. Because Ajali police station is not necessarily a big police station and is not known for any form of um, brutality and all those stuff, my, my, my daddy decided that my mom should go and get the boy out. So my mom went the next morning to bail him out. When she got there, she was informed that they had been transferred to Okuzusas. So my mom had to call my dad immediately and inform him that like, what information she's getting now is that these boys have been transferred to Okuzusas. It was really scary for my dad because Okuzusas is really like a very scary place to be. So one, when he heard that, he had to come back home and then both of them had to go to Okuzo SAS to go find my brother. When they got there, the OC of SAS, CSP James Mwapo, now retired, told them that nobody was arrested or transferred to their station. My parents were like, 
But we went to Ajali police station and they told us that these guy, these boys have been transferred to your station. These men, this man blatantly refused and said nobody was brought to the station or arrested. And that if my brother was arrested, that he would definitely show my parents. As my parents were leaving his office, they saw the boys being led in. So my mom raised alarm and said, ah, that's my son. This is the boy we're talking about. So what mm. do we do now since we've seen him? So what do we do? And this man says that they should throw, like they should leave the station. They were thrown out of the station. The next day, which was, which was on the 1st of December, they go back to meet the man and the man tells them point blank that he has killed the boys and there's nothing that can be done about it. Blank to their face. My mom fainted and I had to be rushed to the hospital. And when they came back, they decided to talk and decide on what to do. I advised, so did so many other people advised that we go to the commissioner of police. The commissioner of police then is Mr. Balana Sarawa. I heard that he's retired now too, but he was a commissioner of police for Anambra State in 2012. He was who we met, who my parents met with, and informed him of what they got from James Wafo. The commissioner of police called James Wafo, and then he denied that anybody was arrested or killed. My parents were other man, like, we saw him at the station, and this man told us that he had killed the boys. And James Wafo still refuses to acknowledge this. He said he's a liar, nobody was arrested or killed in his station. So for the past eight years, we've been, we don't know if the boy is late. We do not know if he's alive. We can't say for sure who he's telling the truth to, which was why I kept on screaming on Twitter. I started writing about this thing since 2019 when I, I, I like got the hang of Twitter. I won't lie, I didn't know how to manage Twitter before. It was overwhelming at first. 2019, after I watched When They See Us, I made my first tweet about my brother's issue because it was a very triggering movie for me. So I made the first tweet. Some people reached out, but nothing came out of it. 2020, I found out that James Wafo was on Twitter. And it was devastating to see the killer of your brother or the person that is supposedly responsible for his disappearance, having his best life on Twitter. It was, it was heartbreaking. It was traumatic for me. So I called him out on Twitter. And when I called him out, this man did not deny arresting these boys. He said, it's on his tweets. If you check his tweets, you will see it. He said that the diseased suspects were arrested by social and so officers and that it was not him that arrested them. But I struggle to understand why people that were already arrested became diseased under your watch. And nothing has been done about it. I've written no petition. Struggle. Sorry, Dalit. We not we know no they, they were not taken to court. It was just yes, arrested in his station, and then they became diseased in your station. It was it was annoying and painful for me to read on Twitter that my brother that was arrested is now diseased with no proper due process, like there was no due process. We didn't go to court. We didn't get, have a lawyer defend him, nothing. The court did not say he was guilty. Do you get, this man judged these boys and executed them, that's it. But the most so, painful part of it is- okay. I, I think putting, you know, a good chunk of the story to be able to, you know, probe further. So if you are, if you are going on the streets today, why, why, what would justice mean to you for your brother? Justice for me will be the arrest and prosecution of James Swanfo. He has to tell us clearly what happened to those boys. What did they do? Why did it become his responsibility to now take laws into his own hands? He has, that's what I want. So when people say they're going to compensate people who have suffered from SARS brutality, I don't want that. It's not what I'm seeking for. That's not why I'm on the street. That's not why my mom is crying every day. That's not why she has not celebrated her birthday for the past seven years. No, that's not it. The reason why she's cr crying and clamoring for justice is because she wants to know what happened. What did these boys do? We never were told what these boys did. We do not know the crime they committed. Why would James Wafo summarily execute these boys? My anger, especially, is that James Wafo became an SSA to the Anambra State Government. Thereby, we were denied justice because 
when he retired, we made plans to have him prosecuted. Becoming the SSA means that he was covered by the immunity of the gov governor. Now, during the NSAS protest, he, he was sacked. The governor promised us that he will be prosecuted. Right now, James Wampo is nowhere to be found. He is nowhere to be found. So you, you get what it means for us that, like, chances are that we'll never get justice, we'll never get closure. Don't say that, Obianoju. I am so sure that we will find justice. I mean, this is why I wanted you to come on air to share your story. We will find justice. So, and, and that's why I want everybody to stay calm and understand the reason we went out on the street. We didn't go out on the street because we wanted to go, go and start looting things, you know, or spreading yeah. fake news. The real issues. There are real people that have lost people. And we lost track of that. Uti, do you want to come in here before, you know, we let um, Obianoju continue? Uh, I am, I'm stunned by the story. So it's not a new story to me. Um, I saw it on Twitter at the time when, when um, she started tweeting. And, you know, the, the story itself, and this is what I was trying to say before that, the movement of NSARS is so powerful. No matter how many times you hear these stories being narrated, it gives you chills. So it's, it just, you know, I'm saddened, I'm even more saddened now to, to hear that justice may be denied because now we don't know where this person is. We don't know whether he's still in the country. And in my mind, I'm asking, why was he simply sacked? If you sacked him for that reason, why was he not arrested at that point immediately? So we start to look at the areas where there's culpability because a lot of the time, people don't get justice because nothing is followed through on. So many opportunities are lost. So many opportunities are wasted. When I was asking the other, you know, in my reflection, I said, so many places or so many things come to play in this issue. Now, why do we have people who are arrested without due process, with no recourse to the judiciary? Why does it take so long to get a person before a judge? All these gaps allow people to become judge, jury, executioner, as we have seen. And these are the questions, these are the reforms we should be chasing. These are the valid things that we should be going after. So it's painful awesome. to see. Absolutely. You know, like um, like Oti rightly said, Obianuju, I didn't even know the popular story, you know, that, that I, I read all over social media was your story. I'm just linking a family member to the story that I, I had read. But if you were to advise people right now, because there are fake news flying all over the place, you know, it is the fake news is not helping, you know, to, to really, really dwell on the real issues. For me, those are distractions. Those are, yeah, those are, it's taking us away from the core issues. If you were to advise people, you know, what would what would it what would it be? What would you say to Nigerians, you know, that are going out of, on the streets, you know, vandalizing and all of those things, trying to derail us from the reason we even went on the streets to protest in the first place? What would that be, would you? If I were to talk to Nigerians, and I'm talking to all of us now, see, let us not delegitimize our movement. Mm -hmm. The moment we begin this vandalism, the moment we start looting it delegitimizes our, our movement. It delegitimizes our desire, what we want. We were clear on what we want. We do not seek for these things that, we are, that these people are stealing. We do not want food from ShopRite. We do not want things from Lekimo. What we want is justice. See, vandalizing people's things would not get us this justice. Instead, we'll have backlash. We have to re-strategize center our desires and our demands again. This vandalism will not help us. What it does is blacklist us. It makes us seem like we do not know what we want, but we know what we want. What we want is justice. For everybody who has lost their loved one to SARS brutality, they will tell you this, and I'm telling you for free, what we want is justice. For me, most people will say, oh, an ambassador government said that they have slated amount of money to give to SARS brutality victims. It, that's not what, how can I show you that's not what Jim Moisak's family wants. That's not what Andrew's family wants. What they want is an answer. Like, why did this have to happen? Why did it happen? Give us closure. Because you see, the difference is that 
for me and my family, if my brother was dead and we saw the dead body and buried him, it gives you some sort of closure that you can go to his graveside and maybe cry and talk to him, right? Or like when you don't know, and that is why I was on the streets and that is why I'm still on the streets and I'm asking for just justice and accountability. I don't want, this looting is distracting us. It's distracting from our movement. And we really need to like curb it. We need to go to the grassroots and talk to these thugs and these hoodlums. We need to beg them if need be. Maybe tell them our stories and they understand us. I'm willing to do this even. Let them understand that like for us it's beyond what they're going to steal. It's beyond that. What we want is justice. We want closure. We want to be able to sleep at night and know that justice has been served and has been seen to be served. I think you have, I mean, there's no add to that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you thank for you. sharing your story. We are, we are gonna on, I, I know it's very emotional right now, but we are gonna make sure that justice is found. You know, we will make thank sure that you. we get for every single one that has lost someone in this, um, in the hands of um, police brutality or SARS or who, whatever name they call themselves, we will find justice for them. So, but we'll take a short break now. And when we return, Uti and I will continue the conversation. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you.